Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about humanizing healthcare. We have an epic guest joining us today. We have Dr. Jessica Zitter. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. And I'm super excited. You initially met Ron at the JCC doing an event there. And then Ron (laughs) taught me about you and I got really excited about you. And then I looked into your work and I got even more excited because this is something that we haven't talked about and that society's not really talking about. Maybe more ancient cultures have had a better rooting and feeling for how to deal with death in a very humane way. And how to, but now the healthcare infrastructure has gotten very complex and there's so much to talk about here. Jessica Zitter is a ICU and palliative care physician in Oakland at Highland Hospital uh, for the last 10 years now. Uh, She's also the author of Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life. She is also is the feature in Extremis, which is this, is Extremis? Extremis? Extremis. Extremis is better to pronounce, Extremis, um, which is a 26 minute, 24 24 minute short documentary about kind of what you're right about Mm -hmm. in Extreme Measures. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, and so this is this is really important, pressing stuff that I guess is not being talked about. So, and that's really important to talk about. So why don't we let's start with talking about who you are before we get to the to the these pressing themes of the book. So how did you even get your footing in desire for being a physician and being in healthcare? Because you did some Stanford and some Harvard, some UCSF, some Berkeley, and. That's a lot of awesome schools to go through to get to where you're at. So tell well, us by the time I got to that round of going to those schools, I had already sort of decided I was going to be a doctor. I decided I was going to be a doctor when I was kind of a baby. I, came, uh, I was born into a family. It was a family business, really. Um, uh, my family was a bunch of immigrants. And uh, very quickly, once reaching Canada, which is where I was, I'm from, Montreal, um, the both sides of my family you know, immediately started producing doctors. This was like something that was very much a part of our family culture, maybe a part of our religious culture. Um, it was v- sort of this very venerated sub- uh, profession and I had all these role models, mostly men, uh, who were very intense surgeons and running you know, ERs and, and uh, different kinds of very interventionalist types of doctors who had kind of grown up in this time of specialization within the healthcare system, which really started in the 60s. You know, that's when we started specializing medicine. And so I uh, decided that the way that I could be useful in the world was to follow in their path and to learn how to use a variety of different technologies and machines to really keep people alive and to take care of them that way. Um, So I went into this very intensive training uh, uh, sequence uh, at these schools and kind of in these programs and yeah. uh, came out the other end as a pulmonary and critical care doctor. Yeah. And that's how I ended up in medicine. You, your fam- that was so funny. You were describing your family <laughs> like they're like pumping out like doctors. Like that's so interesting that when yeah. you have really strong like a family that has a really strong like kind of like values and mission that they know what they are doing in the world that then the kids kind of are more easily able to, I guess, find something that they want to do versus parenting that is a little bit more kind of like, well, whatever. So true. It was so much easier for me than a lot of my friends because I just sort of came out into this path. And I, I uh, actually remember, you know, after college, a few years after college, just watching some of my friends who'd been in the liberal arts and who were kind of like trying to figure their, and I was just like, I got my beeper on my pocket and I'm going. And it was, yeah. it was kind of an easy, I, I, mean, I mean, I don't say that proudly. It was kind of an easy, straight yeah, ahead yeah, path. Yeah. And it's brought you lots of meaning in life and that's really important. Well, you know, I think it brought me meaning mostly once I started to make it mine. Um, mm-hmm. I, I initially went into this with an idea of what I was supposed to do and the healthcare medical training experience was very happy to tell me. Um, I thought I was supposed to be this sort of high intensity physician and there's many quick and there's paths to doing that that are very easily taught. Protocols and you know learning how to do different kinds of technologies and treatments and catheters and all that stuff. So 
I just got sucked into that whole training path. The meaning came once I started to step back and say, okay, now I'm doing this, and how do I want to make this something that feels better to me? Because I was starting to experience some moral distress in the way that I was practicing medicine um, yes. in this protocolized yes. approach. Yes. So you, you just laid it out right there. So there's this protocolized approach, and we've heard, we've had doctors talking to us before about going off protocol and being able to do things in a way that actually helps with either the morals of the patient or the, it said there's so many different <laughs> ways to talk about this but you specifically i see you you actually actually what the statistic in the book is quite i think quite high is it was it 40 percent of deaths occur in the ICU at the peak in like the 80s and 90s. The, yeah, the, the, and that number's gone down. I think the most recent data shows that 30% of people die either in an ICU or having recently been discharged from an ICU. Okay, okay, 30, so that's a lot. That's almost a third of people are dying in, yeah. like in, IC, in ICUs or right afterward, yeah. and that's like, whoa. Yeah. So what that's, and what you've been dealing with in that case, and I want you to explain what palliative care is, mm -hmm. but just, that there is a lot of people that are without their family, without people that you know love them right there when they're in the ICU, that they're having some sort of stress about mm -hmm. what do I need to do with the medical system, what options are there. Right. Yeah, start telling us So, about that. you know, what you're talking, I mean, the fact is, look, I am n in no way throwing technology under the bus. I am not throwing ICUs under the bus. I have and many of my colleagues, we have saved many a life using these technologies Absolutely. and sent people back home to their families. Yes. And there is nothing sweeter than that. That yeah. is one of the beautiful things about the, our modern healthcare system. The problem is that, um, that there's, there's several reasons why we're not only taking people who can benefit from it, but we're sweeping everybody into it. And when, when you take people who are not really going to have that kind of benefit of a recovery and going home. And you take everybody, even you know, the frail, the elderly, the terminally ill, the dying, and you still do that same treatment to them. I call that the end of life conveyor belt because what it is is this, this like churning, protocolized, literally conveyor belt uh, that just takes everybody indiscriminately and does the same things to them, the same uh, support of organs as they start to fail. Uh, as you would with somebody who really could potentially then recover. But you're doing this to people who, who won't recover. And we do it, we, that's what caused me this distress was I realized subconsciously, it wasn't even like I had words in the beginning, that we were taking so many people who I knew weren't gonna benefit from this type of treatment and doing these things to them, which really, as you alluded to, uh, can cause tremendous suffering because what it means to be attached to machines is several things. Number one, you've got machines going into your mouth. You can't talk. You've got your arms tied down frequently because we can't have you pulling these things out. So people are lying there in bed on their backs, things in their mouths mm. with their arms tied down. You've, uh, you're kind of sedated. You may be in pain. We don't necessarily know if you're in pain. So there's a sort of haze of possibly depends again on who you are and what's going on but of pain and slight mild delirium which is very confusing and and distressing and most importantly as you said the family the whole structure from which you came is not there you're in this very foreign mm. sterile place your family's kind of even if they are in the room they're kind of back they're afraid you know you're coming in you're going to touch all these different tubes mm. you sort of stay away so it's a very isolating experience and that is, I think, part of the reason that so many people are dying badly in this country. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and there's this whole idea of a good death, and we'll, we'll get to that. I want, I want, you started, you really started talking about all of the variables that are going into the equation of like an, of an, of an, of a human experience inside of an, an ICU in this, in this case with family, tubes, um, the delirium that's coming in, potentially sedated, this, there's so much that, that is there, and then the, there's this whole like end of life conveyor belt. Okay, tell us about palliative care because okay. yeah, this was quite interesting for me to learn okay. about from you cloaking. This <clears throat> is cool. Okay, well, so I'll give you a little background. Okay, you know, um, and, and I talk about this a lot in my book because it feels like you know that movie um, was it Zelig? Well, Forrest Gump and Zelig, where there's this person who like 
finds themselves in places that were kind of like turning points in a movement. And, and that's what I kind of, when I was writing my book, felt happened to me. In 1996, a big study came out. And I, by the way, had just finished my pulmonary fellowship. The study came out, it was called the Support Trial. And it looked at how people die in America. And it was a shock to the people who are conducting this study. It was a huge study, five centers in America. And the reason I say it was a zelig moment for me was because the study had been conducted during medical, my medical school years. And one of the centers that conducted it was Case Western, where I went to medical school. And in fact, one of the, the head person of that site was uh, Dr. Albert, uh, Alfred Connors, who was my ICU attending mentor, the person who taught me about ICU when I was in medical school. So he was conducting this study to understand how are people dying in America with other five other centers in the United States. Yeah. The study wasn't published until several years later, 1996, when I was already finishing up my fellowship in pulmonary and critical care. But what the study showed was an alarming state of how people are dying in America. Huge percentage of people, again, dying on machines uh, who probably wouldn't, were not ever going to be helped by those machines. A huge percentage of people whose preferences, if they had had them, were not known by their physician. This sort of clear lack of communication yes. between physicians. That was very alarming. A lot of pain, et cetera. The second phase of that trial. That's crucial. Those dying preferences are crucial. Crucial. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I can't remember the, the statistics right now, but I think 31, uh, I'm not gonna even talk about them because I'll mm -hmm. mess it up. But uh, very few people who had preferences had, this had been information that their physicians knew. So, um, they did a second part to the trial. The first part was observational. What's going on? What's the state? And as I said, the state was not good. The second part was, okay, let's figure out an intervention where we can come to the physicians, we can provide, enhance the communication, we'll provide information from the patient and family to the physician, from the physician back to the patient and family, we'll enhance communication, et cetera. Mm -hmm. No change, no improvement. Very, very mm. disturbing. And even though this wasn't the etiology or the reason that the palliative care movement started to rise, I'm sure it was a big factor. Because mm -hmm. people started to say, wow, people are really dying badly in America. So the palliative care movement um, started, I'd say, I mean, people will disagree with me, but it, it was the early 2000s that they really started putting money into studying this. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation started giving grants to sort of study this new approach, which is palliative care. Mm -hmm. And actually, before we go mm -hmm. into that, let mm -hmm. me tell you what palliative care is. Yes. To pal palliative care comes from the word palliare in Latin. Palliare means to cloak. And you can sort of imagine this person, this sick person, this patient, this somebody coming and cloaking them, sort of caring for them attending to everything that might be frightening them, scaring them, causing distress. Yeah. And so the palliative care approach, which kind of came from the hospice movement, which had been started by, um, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the 80s, uh, by Dame Cecily Saunders in England, uh, this sort of modern hospice approach to bring this multidisciplinary approach to caring for patients, mm -hmm. from a, thinking about the social variables, thinking about all of the things that a nurse might think about, thinking about the things that a chaplain, the spiritual suffering, which mm -hmm. is something we don't even think, think about, about in the hospital. Yeah, right. We don't even consider that. Yeah. We keep religion away. That's not real medicine. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, and of course, physician, the, the, the management of the that, symptoms. That binding with the infinite is actually so crucial at, in the process of, of death. Yeah. Well, let me just give you a quick statistic about that because I just did a talk about the faith issue. I, I'm, I'm Jewish, but, and I, you know, I'm sort of agnostic in the way many, many of us are. I don't feel comfortable praying at the bedside with my patients. And there are a lot of my patients in, in a public hospital in Oakland, California are, are Christian, African American, very communal prayers. And so a lot of the praying that might, might go on in a hospital like mine is very communal and, 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 and loud and, and, and active. And it's not something that I feel like I know how to do. I certainly don't 
you know, feel skilled in it. Um, and I also feel like, well, that's not really mine to do. And most importantly, as a doctor and the way our culture works, we sort of feel like that's supposed to be separate. Like if we get into anything that, has to, that looks like faith, oh. it's sort of like it diminishes us is the way we are thinking. We are supposed to keep science and uh -huh. faith separate. Yeah. And so I never thought that I was needed, even as I started practicing palliative care more and more, when, this, you know, when, when that was needed, well, the chaplain has it, and I'll go on to the next patient. And what I'm learning... Science and faith are kind of merging together more into the future. It's interesting. I think it really... Well, because here's the data. The data show that 91% of people consider themselves spiritual. 74% of people mm. affiliate with an actual faith group. Mm. And I don't remember the number, but a yeah. very large yeah. percent of people yeah. want their physicians, would want their physicians to talk with them and even to pray with them, to, but to acknowledge their faith. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost never happening. Yeah. And I know it ain't, wasn't happening with me. Yeah. And so what I've learned wow. is when I just stay present and I stay with my chaplain, who's amazing, in the room, that means so much to my patients that enhances our relationship. This is part of the cloaking that's happening. It's, it's just this multi, this inter, we call it trans, inter, interprofessional cloaking of a patient where we all work together on a team. That's so different from what I experienced in the intensive care unit yeah. where it's very hierarchical. The doctor's up here, no one's really, you know, the doctor's making all the decisions. Whatever else is happening is sort of happening in an ancillary way. Way, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not, and I'll tell you, some, remind me to tell you a couple of examples of that. I could give you example after example, but how it really hurts not only the patient, but it hurts all the healthcare practitioners and, and, and takes, again, the humanity, sucks the humanity out of the experience of caring for people. But anyway, that's what the palliative care movement was. And it, it was sort of growing in the 80s, the 90s, um, and 96 the support trial. Mm -hmm. And then early 2000s, Robert, late 90s, different kinds of groups, um, especially the Robert Wynn Johnson uh, Foundation, started giving money to try to enhance the types of um, um, interventions that palliative care teams do in different environments. So there was this grant mm -hmm. called Enhancing Communication in the Intensive Care Unit. And it came out from the night, it was a call for proposals in, in 2002, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, four hospitals won that grant. One of them, hmm. by chance, happened to be one that I had just started working at in Newark, New Jersey, Very two months before. Cool. And I was a new ICU attending, Newark, New Jersey, in this hospital. And all of a sudden, they had won this grant. I didn't even know about the grant yet, but all of a sudden, these people start showing up in the ICU. Sweet called the family support team because no oh, one knew it. No yeah. one knows what palliative care family is. Support the family support team. The family support team. I was yeah. like, well, who are these people? And they're talking to my patients. They're, they'd come up to me and say, hey, did, I don't think that family understands their prognosis. And I was like, who, who are these people? Yeah, that's fun. Who wow. are these people? That's a great first comment to say. It's like, does the family even get what's going on? Well, they were, and I, but I was annoyed. I was like, this, this, Who is, are my, they? this is my patient. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I can handle this. I'm a good communicator. I, I'm uh, compassionate. And then I had my epiphany moment. So I'd been working yeah, yeah. there about, I don't know, eight months, nine months. And this nurse who ran the family support team, Pat Murphy. That's great. She says to me, when I'm, one day I'm putting in this catheter into a dying patient. And I know this patient's dying. Yeah. And she's standing in the doorway, and I look up and I see her, and I got my gown and my gloves, and I'm yeah. about to put this thing, this woman's moaning under the bed sheet. Jeez. And I'm putting this huge catheter in her neck. Jeez. Pat stands at the doorway, and she goes like this, call the police. They're torturing a patient in the ICU. Yeah. The nurses were there, the medical student was there. Everybody's around. And I was like, what? <laughs> Me torturing somebody? I'm just trying to do my job. Anyway. What an interesting perspective on when a patient is basically dying, they're at their last moments. There's no, there's not yeah. that faith, that family, that those things that the per, their dying preferences are not there. It's just like the jamming of more of the conveyor belt of medical devices and things to yeah. 
try and get nanoseconds more. Nanoseconds. And not even asking her. You know what? You know what permission I got? I got permission from her husband, who, by the way, I had sent off to the waiting room, so he was away from her for these two hours, which were two out of maybe another 16 hours that she would be on this earth. Telling him, we're going to do this because it will do this and it will help in this way. And he's like, okay, okay, thinking yeah. we're going to help. Uh. I, you know, she died the next day. I, I knew, you know, really, I knew she was coming to the end. Didn't even tell him that there was a chance this wouldn't do anything. There was a big chance it wouldn't do anything. And didn't give him really the option because he's a good husband. He wants to help. Yeah. And if the doctor's suggesting this next yeah, yeah, yeah. thing, what husband's going to say no? Wow. So that was an epiphany. And, and then so that is so interesting that you ended up being right there when the grant was made. Crazy. And then, then you were right there with the palliative care kind of movement. Crazy. Forward. And Early so, stages, because it didn't get become a subspecialty in medicine until 2008. So this was 2003. It was many years beforehand. And uh, I feel so lucky. I mean, I at first was really, like, defensive and, you know, wait a minute. And, and, but that moment, because I had been feeling this sort of distress building. And when she, that happened, it took me a few days. I got angry at first, and then, and then I went up to Pat. I, went, I remember I walked into her office, yeah. and I said, you know what? Teach me. Te you teach me. You're right. Teach me what to do. Yeah. And that's when I, yeah, she, that's she said, okay. So my mentor, people say to me, who I are I want to give you a high five. That's awesome. Who are your biggest mentors? That's awesome. A nurse and a chaplain. And, yeah, chaplain. So the fact that you had the moment where you came to your own realization that it's the humility. It was the humility. No, I love that. I think it's so, so crucial that more of us realize that, hey, somebody else that has a different perspective on the situation can actually help make these situations across the world better for us together. Yeah. That's beautiful. And when you can actually, like anything, like with any humility in life, the humility of learning that you weren't a great parent in this moment, which I learn a lot, unfortunately, and try to... You know, humility actually, once you can just let it be and say, okay, you know what? I didn't do a great job. I didn't do a great job there. It's such a relief, such a relief. And it opens you up to something so much more powerful. And um, I've had many, 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 many moments of humility. And uh, I think it's one of my biggest teachers. I'm just writing right. an article that's going in about um, I call it putting, my, it's called putting my patience in front of my ego, but it's... Oh, interesting. It, it, it's yeah. talking about how even as a palliative like care that. doctor, I have to admit, I still feel like I'm supposed to be the most important person in the room yeah, yeah. as the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning that I'm not. The patient is and their dying the patient preferences is are... The first. Yeah. A lot of times, the chaplain has so much more to offer That's than right. I do. And you know what? Yeah. I need to just sit there and witness. Yeah. I'm not used to that. Yeah. I'm not used to that. And I'm learning That's how so important it is. And, um, and I feel really grateful for it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different, you know, different way from how I was trained. And, and anyway, I feel the world opening up a little bit. Your learning experience is becoming our learning experience. Ah! <laughs> and it's so fascinating because we get to live through you, through your oh, experiences, you. in the sense, and and I'm I'm happy that you came to that moment of openness, and now, yeah, I'm, I'm imagining like the way that the chaplain's interacting with the patient, and the patient kind of like almost drops into their their body and the and the spirit and the infant yeah. more than potentially being like, okay, we're gonna give you a couple more hours <laughs> in this yeah. in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, there's so much to talk about. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then over the last like 10 years, it's been kind of this developing out of the, hu you know, the humility, getting more and more doctors to be uh, working with this more disciplines of, of people that can help uh, actually tend to the patient's needs first with palliative care. Yeah. Whatever it is that the patient needs, yes. finding out what the patient needs, finding out where the most suffering is, whether I'm the ICU attending or the palliative care attending. It's always about the patient and eliciting from them what they need, what they need to know, what they want to know, and how we can help them achieve what's most important to them. Yeah, yeah. So then, okay, so then through this 10-year this period, 
So did Highland get also, did you kind of bring palliative care to Highland? No, no I mean, how, no. How did that, yeah, tell me about how the, that yeah. period worked before we get to extreme sure, measures sure. and stuff. Well, palliative care has been growing now. You know, in fact, uh, there's a, 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 I mean, the movement has, it's fascinating actually. Um, really, it, it, it's, 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 it's captured, in some ways, I think it's captured the imagination of many uh, in, in, in the non-medical community saying, wow, I, w I didn't know death could be so bad because it's, we're starting to talk about it more, even in the lay press, and people are starting to say, whoa, wait a minute. So this is how many grassroots movements are born from the non, you know, from, from the grassroots. So we're hearing a lot of, we're having a lot more kind of activity and movement in the, out there in the non-medical community saying, wait a minute, I don't wanna, I don't want this to be my only option. And then within the medical community, there's so many people like me. So many people who just needed a little something to wake them up, to say, yeah, I don't, I, I don't wanna be working like that as an automaton. I do care about my patients and wanna be connecting hu in, in a humanistic way. The vast majority of people who go into medicine are really good people. And people I work with are fantastic. And giving you give them one little alternate route, alternate approach, and they want it, just like I did. And um, what we're finding in, at, at Highland is that it's just been amazing. Just in the past, even the past year, um, we have watched our consult numbers rise rapidly. Mm. And what's interesting there is that, um, you know, you're seeing this called culture change within the, within the healthcare world. For a while, people were like, you know what, that kind of stuff, like I used to think, if I just had more time, I would do it. I'll get to it. I'll get to that conversation with a patient. I'll, I am caring. I am compassionate. But I think what people are starting to realize is, number one, I don't have the time. So I do need some support from the palliative care division. Number two, I need some spiritual support. I need some social support. So let's pull in palliative care. And also, less from the practical perspective of, I need these types of things that the palliative care uh, group can do. I think there's also just this, this incredible sense of, wow, there is so much suffering at the end of life. And I don't wanna do this alone. Mm -hmm. So what, what we you know, have to figure out in, as a movement in palliative care is, is how are we going to, how are we going to um, leverage our presence? We can't have enough palliative care doctors to attend to all of the suffering that's happening. What we can do is we can teach other doctors, like I was taught by Pat, how to do some of this work themselves, how to do some elicitation of preferences and values from patients, which we never really learned how to do formally, how to do some matching of preferences and values with what we're gonna do next in terms of medical decision making. Um, how to manage pain, because pain is a very big problem. People are dying in pain at very large numbers. And I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't really taught a huge amount about managing pain. For me, in the ICU, the whole goal was keep the blood pressure up. And let me tell you something, pain and sedation medications lower the blood pressure. There were many times, I'm embarrassed to tell you, where I didn't even think about treating pain in a patient who was dying. I thought about keeping their blood pressure up primarily. That's not, that's mm -hmm. not okay. And so we're, we, we can spread that information out to other practitioners so that a lot of what they're coming to us for right now that's causing us to just honestly not be able to keep up with the workload is stuff that we can have them do, what's called primary palliative care. Palliative care that's delivered by the primary team, not by us. That we're more yeah. specialty palliative care. Interesting. Now, this seems as though it's been going on actually <coughs> in different capacities for like thousands of years. Yes. And then it's just interesting that now the West kind of in some ways messed some things up. Yes, with, you yeah. put it perfectly. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Okay. Do you want to know the history of how we messed it up in the West? I would like to know that. Yeah. And I want to also tell you that I think that a lot of people would actually probably prefer if they were only had like a day yeah. or whatnot left. I would love to go and die in the middle of Muir Woods or on Stinson Beach or something like that. Like I would, like um, amongst people with family and whatnot, yeah. but me laying there amongst the trees and animals and beach and water and not in a hospital. 
you know. Most people agree with you. And the problem is, you know, we, we, we have, there's data that shows, you know, 80% of people say they would want to die at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, at home. Which is not happening. I mean, at this point, the numbers, the most recent numbers are 40% of people are dying at home, but that's even an overestimate because of that 40%, there's a huge number of what we're calling, and a rising number of something that's called burdensome transitions, which means people are getting home, but right before they die oh, from I the see. hospital. Oh, oh. <laughs> so that 40% is an overestimate. People are not dying the way they would like oh, to die. Sure, sure. Now, the fact that you would like to die in Muir Woods is great information. That's Someone, a dying preference. It's yeah. dying preferences. Yeah. You have to ask, people have to, no, no I don't want to even, the, the medical world shouldn't be asking you. You should be thinking. This yes. uh, death consciousness. Yes, exactly. We are so, we're pretending we should, we're never gonna die. So like we don't have think our own about note, it. Like our own dying preferences note with our own, ten, like what we care, what we want to do, yeah. The Buddhists say, death, sh I, I'm gonna butcher this, but death should always be on your, on shoulder. your shoulder. We have a service that we use called We Croak that sends us daily death quotes, oh like gosh. five times we a croak. day. I love that. Yeah, it's so good. And that way, what's, what's the quote right now? What does it say? I see he's on his. Yes, yeah, it's, it's um, All right, current We Croak says. Whatever you're meant to do, do it now. The conditions are always impossible. Hmm. There you go. Well, the fact is, I was just speaking with Frank Ostaseski, who's you know the founder of Zen Hospice, an okay. amazing man, a Buddhist. We're going to actually be in conversation soon in April. I'm really oh, excited. Oh, interesting. Maybe we should have him on sometime. Oh, he's afterward. terrific. That'd be great. Very smart guy, and he said that you know having an awareness of death is what lets you live your life better. And I, I, I agree I with that. I think it's so true. You know, we croak agree agrees. That, yeah. But, you know. Helps you live more presently. He also said, and I totally agree with him, that so much of this movement that's really arisen in the past few years, about this interest, this grassroots interest in death and making death s sort of a, an, an amazing experience is, is complicated because, you know, it puts too much pressure on that moment you're focusing so much on that moment. So if that moment doesn't quite go the way you want it to, that could be seen as a big failure. The real focus should be on how is this, you're living all those days leading up to that. Yeah. That moment you want yeah. to do everything you can to make it, so, it consistent with your goals. It would be great if you could die in Mirror Woods. You know, you might not be able to die in Mirror Woods. Right. So and um, you know, as I said, um, I've seen many stories of people doing everything perfectly bringing in hospice at the right time, having this incredible supportive family in place, having a great commun you know, community, a uh, faith community that comes and checks on them and plays guitar and all that stuff. And the fact is that that doesn't always guarantee a good death either. So it, it cannot just be focused on how do you make that moment of death so great. It has to really be, you know, yes, you want to try to enhance that, but like putting all the other stuff in place during your life, that's what it that's should be right. about. Yeah. And that's where we find a lot of our meaning in life is by yeah. putting the right pieces together that we <laughs> care about that leads us to the most meaning in our lives. Okay, now that this this has been super solid. I want to see <laughs> what we can get to with some of the. Oh, I was going to tell yes, you. Tell us. Yes, I was going to tell, tell you us. how we screwed it up. The, let's tell us the screw up. Okay. The West. Yes, it's yes. actually fascinating. Okay. Um, I do a talk that's called "All That Glitters," and it's about. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's about the rise of the intensive care unit, mm -hmm. with all of its other associated, what are they called, um, condiments mm. around it. Oh, the condiments. The condiments. Those and multi thousand dollar add ons. The add ons, right. <laughs> the siloing of healthcare, the hyper focusing that started to happen in the 1930s. Do you remember the, well, you're young, but you know the heart-lung machine, the iron lung? Did you ever see pictures of that? I, that sounds somewhat familiar. The iron lung machine <clears throat> saved, I don't know, tens or hundreds of, I think hundreds of thousands of people from dying from polio in the polio outbreak of the late 20s and early, uh, and 30s and 40s. Oh, whoa, and 50s. this thing is crazy. Yeah. A negative pressure 
-hmm. ventilator, also known as iron lung or pulmonary. Yes. So it nearly was... obsolete mechanical respirator, which enables a person to breathe on their own in a normal yeah. manner when a muscle control is lost. Mm -hmm. Oh, what? So here's the thing. Oh. In the ni in the 1920 in 1928, there were two got two guys. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about my cough. Okay, two, two guys from the Harvard School of Public Policy, I believe it was, or, or, or some kind of school at Harvard, and they decided to create a machine. They literally took two engines out of vacuum cleaners. Whoa. And they used them to reverse suck air out of a chamber. Yeah. And that earliest prototype kind of sat in the base, at basement at Harvard. <clears throat> and then when it came time in the sort of mid 30s, late 30s, for the polio epidemic to start to kick in. They started to put people into these, these chambers. And the chambers basically would suck air out, so it would <gasps> inflate the lungs of a person rhythmically. And tens, and I think hundreds of thousands of patients who would have died from polio, which causes a weakening, so you cannot, you can't, you don't have the muscle Do strength that. to breathe, uh -huh. survived. My Auntie Fanny survived and went on to live normal lives. And but how do you gain muscle strength, though? How does that you don't, you because do. polio is a virus. And so once the virus kind of got out of your body and you could regain, it, it, oh, so it, it was a bridge. It while, oh, it's a bridge. I see. A bridge. Oh, until the virus gets out of the body. OK. Just a bridge. Kept okay. them alive. You can, they had these like. They oh, had, so we thought we could iron lunged out all of the. And we did. <laughs> we had huge success with it. It was unbelievable. Interesting. Then around World War II and Korea during those wars was the first time that physicians learned how to manage shock. And they could manage, you know, massive hemorrhage and shock, infectious shock on the battlefield. They had these shacks, like MASH, the movie MASH, mm -hmm. you know, the, the TV yes, series. Yes, yes. They would be right near the fighting. And they would go and they would drag these people back into these things and they would resuscitate them. What? So for the first time Whoa. ever <clears throat> in warfare, yeah. Young and healthy soldiers were resuscitated who would have died and sent home. Yeah, through the shock. And so that's through, is that mostly using, through the ca cardio, through the Well, it was, it was using heart? hemodynamic management, which was, again, this sort of new phys principles of physics and really of resuscitation. So people were learning how to resuscitate bodies that would have died. This was new in the mid-1900s. 1958, the first intensive care unit at Johns Hopkins was created. And you know you need room. These, are, these machines, by the way, the iron lung gave way to the modern mechanical ventilator, which we use now to, to inflate lungs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now it's not, not negative pressure that's sucking open. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry. It's positive pressure that's pushed into. into yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> you need room for these things. You need electricity. You need tubes that have vacuuming, because we need to use a lot of vacuuming to suck away things. You needed a space. And so the intensive care unit was formed. And that was 1958. In the next 10 years, every hospital in America had at least one intensive care unit. Oh, thank you. Every intensive care unit had at least one. Now, we have now almost created this ridiculous situation. We have an intensive care unit for every possible thing you could want. Pediatric intensive care unit, the PICU. Neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU. Medical intensive care unit, the MICU. Surgical intensive care unit, the SICU. I Whoa. just heard about, and there are m a, a huge multitude. Cardiac intensive care unit. There's a digestive diseases intensive care unit. So not only do we have intensive care units, we have the most intricate subspecialties that you can imagine. Yeah. Hepatology, um, you know, various eye types of, all of these doctors who are now going in and soup subspecializing. Yes. When I was doing my residency at the Brigham, we had 60 graduates at the end of my residency. How many of those do you think went into primary care? Out of 60. <coughs> Excuse me. Half? Three? And everyone two. else specialized? Yeah. Now, things have changed since 1995. Many more people go into primary care, but that's pretty, that's a pretty important thing.
thing to think about. These are, these are, this is my generation wow. of doctors. Yeah. <clears throat> With is spe specialization earns more money yeah. and there's more opportunity than? There's many reasons. <sighs> Thank you, Ron. There's many reasons why you could look, you could, you could wonder why people subspecialized. And here are a few of them. People certainly make a ton more money. Geriatricians, family practice doctors, <clears throat> and primary care doctors, and palliative care doctors make the least amount of money. Yeah, yeah. Okay? It is about $260, I think, you get from Medicare to do a biopsy, a skin biopsy, which takes about six minutes. Mm -hmm. If you want to sit and have a conversation with somebody about end of life uh, practices and their preferences, you get paid, I think it's $78 for half an hour. I mean, it's, it's really discrepant. Oh, I see what, yeah, I see where you're getting at. <clears throat> yeah. The things that we're valuing in our healthcare system, financially, and also in terms of prestige, um, are doing, doing things to people. Yeah, we're, we're in, just in, in a, there's like, I think, it, I think it's half of all of the healthcare expenditures are going towards the orphan related diseases um, yeah. that are affecting such a very, very right. small Tiny. amount of people. Um, versus the, and again, if we valued staying healthy and, <clears throat> and, uh, and these, these preferences, the patient preferences, putting the patient before the ego, like you're writing about right now. Okay, let's, let's dive into, <laughs> we have been already touching on a lot of the things in Extreme Measures, but I want yeah. you to give a kind of like a big picture overview. Tell us about that. So the book is really, it's, it's, it's kind of part memoir. It's my transition story through this, this, this change, this change in, in, in my goals. Um, you know, again, you know, going from being really disease focused or, or an organ focused physician to a whole human focused physician. And it tells that story of that moment of epiphany and what, you know, uh, uh, experience it, it, it talks about a lot of the challenges that exist in our healthcare system that prevent so many of us from going through that transition. Why is it so much easier to be an organ-focused doctor? Why is it so much easier to focus on a procedure than it is to focus on talking to somebody? And it really kind of gives that whole story, both hopefully <clears throat> for a physician audience to sort of for us all to come together and talk about some of these psychological things that are happening inside of us that keep us from doing the things we want to do. And also for, for the lay community, because this book was written for both, yeah. to sort of explain what's going on, to give perspective and hopefully to empower people to understand what the end of life conveyor belt is, how at risk they are for being swept onto it, because we all are, and how important it is to empower yourself to start to think about the things that are important to you, how you live and how you die, and make sure that those things stay front and center throughout your life, yeah. and particularly in the healthcare system. Yeah, I liked going on your journey and that you also explained it to us, the journey of, the pro of this through from the er early 1900s <laughs> until now where things have kind of been going and, and it, it totally seems like we're integrating back to the principles of patient first and using the faith-based <coughs> and, and other end of life, caring about what their preference are, preferences are. You also were teaching us about how it's so important to have a sense, a really deep sense of empathy with a patient and have a you know, if they are asking you to pray with them, <coughs> maybe pray, you know, pray with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Acknowledge your discomfort, acknowledge your fears, um, but I think it's still important to, to do that and to s seek out, figuring out what they want from us that will be most yes. helpful. Yes, and then <coughs> the, their decisions to go with certain, <coughs> and the certain, the treatments that can sometimes be burdens actually decreases if you gain, if you build a relationship with them. Right, and that's borne out not only in my own experience, um, but in the palliative care literature. That when we do engage in communication and in a relationship, 
And the communication and relationship have to be established before you start making decisions about do you want to be full code or not full code or do you want to do this surgery. You have to have a relationship, a therapeutic trusting relationship with somebody before you can really start knowing what the right decisions are and helping them make those decisions. But what we know is that when we do engage in creating those kinds of relationships, um, patients tend to choose lower levels of intensity of treatment at the ends of life. Um, and they die less commonly in the intensive care unit. They tend to die more often in hospice. They tend to die in less pain. It works. It works, yeah. Relationships Will really work. Yeah. work. yeah. The eye to eye human connection, asking them what they care about, what their preferences yeah. are, that, <coughs> that works. Yeah. Okay, I want to see what is going on with your future. Where are you going moving forward with things? What are you thinking? Well, I'm a, a storyteller <coughs> and a coffer. And a coffer. <laughs> <coughs> I really, I am moved by story for my own personal growth. The, the things that move me are the little moments. Like just the other day, I was in a room in, in the pulmonary clinic. I was in pulmonary clinic and I was talking to a patient <coughs> who is kind of dying and I wanted to start to talk to her about her end of life preferences and, and um, <laughs> we had the translator on the phone because she spoke Cantonese. Mm. And um, it was so, it was just such a moment like of, we're sitting here, it's very hard to use a translator on the phone to talk about these really profound things, about these uncomfortable things. And so, <clears throat> and this translator, I would say something and somehow what he would say would stretch out probably eight times longer <laughs> than what I would say. And, and not only was I just like, ah, but the family was like, ah, so it was this bizarre experience. And then th there was some kind of problem with his phone. So every time he'd be talking, it would, like, he'd be, it would sound like he would be pressing a button for a second. So he'd just beep. I mean, it was just a funny Whoa. moment, <laughs> a poignant moment of like an attempt to have a connection with my yeah. patient. And just all of these things the conspiring yeah. against it. Yeah. And um, yeah. I just felt like, okay, that's a moment I have to write about. But so for me, writing stories and noticing these moments, these little things, that's what, that's, what, that's what fuels my growth and makes me think about ways that we can do things differently, and hopefully better one day. And um, I just will keep telling stories. I'm going to be writing and writing and writing. What I also believe is that, that stories, as I, I think we found with the movie Extremis, telling these stories, and by the way, the, the two main stories in Extremis, the movie, are also in my book. You'll recognize them if you pay attention. <clears throat> they go in my book in much deeper detail about those two main stories. But um, I really believe in sort of the power of using story in both lay communities and in medical communities to try to get people to, uh, to, to, to examine themselves and try to grow. Um, and so I've been working with a variety of different um, Teach, teaching experiences that <clears throat> pull in story and use prompt questions and really try to get people to reflect uh, in their own sort of minds on some of these things that are really hard to talk about and try to open up an honest conversation. Yeah. Um, we yeah. did it at UCSF for their Department of Anesthesia and I think that this program could be used in a whole variety of medical training environments and now we're starting to use it in, in, in lay communities. But I think using story to Change behavior is, is really a, an yeah. area that I, I would like to go and, and, and creating new films that also themselves have um, uh, a story to them and a lesson to be learned through watching other people's experiences. We have two films that are coming out and, um, and, and a few more that I would like to uh, work on. So. Well, film and then also writing and then it's, this is all based on self-awareness or awareness increasing about this, about this field, about the subject. Uh, hopefully it'll help people to become more interested and aware, uh, instead of just providing them data, hearing a story and saying, hmm, that's interesting, that, and, and being moved by that to start thinking differently about it. Yeah, yeah. That's huge work. Okay, may, okay we like to ask a couple questions uh, on the way out of the show. I'm interested to hear your thoughts about it. Um, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? <laughs> 
how could we possibly be? I mean, I don't, the numbers just don't support that, that we'd be alone, right? I mean, when I really start to think about it, I go crazy, but it, I can't imagine that there isn't another form of intelligent, of intelligence out in the universe. And when you want to talk about humility, I mean, it, it, I think it's kind of, well, maybe this isn't fair, but I kind of think it's arrogant to think that we'd be the only intelligent life in the universe. Mm -hmm. How could we possibly mm -hmm. be? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, I guess in some ways I do. I would love to see proof of it, but mm -hmm. what do you think? Mm. Are you not supposed I'm to tell? I'm not, well, no, I just, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very, yeah, it's very complicated and interesting. I mean, I'm very fascinated by what exists past the, the three-dimensional perception too. systems that we have. Me too. Um, do you think we're in a simulation? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. You mean, do you think we are a simulation? Yeah, are we? By some higher power? <laughs> I think it's possible. I have no idea, but I do think it's possible. Like an experiment. Uh-huh. What, 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 what kind of nudges you in that direction of thought? Well, I mean, I, as I said, I, I think there must be more intelligent forms of life out in the universe. Mm -hmm. I just do think that. Um, <clears throat> and given that, um, they must know about us. Mm. I would think. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could, I wish I knew for sure. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we're an actual experiment, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kind of freaky That's, to say that. Yeah, but. yeah, it's fun, it's fun. We <laughs> it's like fun and it's kind of, I don't know if we're passing, by the way, if our simulation is working. Oh, oh I'm yeah. I'm yeah. afraid we may have failed in some areas here. Yeah. Well, not we, if it's an experiment. <laughs> they true. are failing. Oh, that's interesting. I just want to throw that out there. Right. You know, if it's a simulation. That's a good point, okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting the, question. The, the experiment side of, of things very, very interesting. Glad you brought that up. She's the first that uh, said that I think about so. an huh. experiment. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. We 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 frequently enjoy that sort of a the zoo hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that's yeah that <coughs> that we are not being discussed about until we evolve to the capacity, to at least some sort of an intelligent capacity to unlock communication with them, like teleportation or wow. something like that. Yeah. Have you seen that Saturday Night Live skit with um, Kate McKinnon, where she's, they're talking about how she, you, have, is, you what, haven't seen, oh my gosh, it's hilarious. There's this whole series of ones that they do where like three people got sucked up into a, uh, uh, some kind of machine from oh, outer space. Sure, sure. And it had this like this amazing experience, the two of them, and I talk about how beautiful it was, uh. and she's talking about, well, I don't know about you, but and she's smoking a cigarette. It's it's hilarious. You should watch what, it. What does she say? She's just talking about <laughs> how what does these, she say? These, these beings from a higher planet, yeah. like you know, they put something up my keister. I mean, she, it's, oh, just, it's totally irrelevant. I mean, yeah. it, it, irreverent and hilarious. Yeah. You should watch. You would get a kick okay, out of it. Okay, cool, cool. It's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> Kate McKinnon series. Um, Very funny. Just the last question: What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Mm. Hmm. Wow, there's so many. But if I had to reduce it to one, it's the human ability to connect. With, you know, people to more. connect. Um, it, it, um, it's just this sense of like what happens when you connect with other people, whether they're friends or people on the street or your patients or your kids, your husband, mm -hmm. um, and you sort of get this sort of connection of um, like like minds and, and, and not being alone in the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because really, if you think about it, I mean, that's very human. Well, it's not just a human thing. My, my dog snuggles up with me, but I don't know, there's something just really profound about, about uh, connecting with something else. 
and not just being this sort of little yeah. robotic loan thing. Mm -hmm. That would have to be it. Yeah, that's beautifully said. Jessica, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you thank for you. coming on and teaching us about all this. Oh, thanks for listening. <laughs> I, we're living through your experiences, oh. and, and that's, been, that's been very <clears throat> interesting to, to, us, to us and hopefully so many of you that are tuning in because who would have thought that, that people on the way uh, to, to death are just not having the ideal good death preferences that they so want? We need to be willing to talk about these things. We do. Yes. We can make it better. We can make it so much better. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Yes. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for coming thank on the for show. Having me. We greatly appreciate it. Thank so you. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Many of us may be having this, these scenarios happening to us in our lives with our families and our near friends. So go and share with other people about dying preferences, having good deaths, etc. Also, thank you to Ron for producing and directing. Give us your thoughts again, everyone. We love you very much for tuning in. Thank you, thank you. And go and build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world. Check out Extreme Measures, links in the bio. Also Jessica's website, links in the bio. Her Twitter, links in the bio. Go check all that out, everyone. Extremis, links in the bio as well. Okay, everyone, much love. We'll see you soon. Build, create, bye. <laughs>